Good morning. So happy that you are here with us on Mother's Day as we continue to walk through the Gospel of Matthew. And the book of Matthew is going to tell us more about the king and the kingdom that we are a part of. And that's a big change in the history of the world. We actually started marking time differently when the king arrived. Now I know that since then we've changed it from BC to AD to BCE to CE, but they still mark it with Jesus' birth. So I really don't know what we've accomplished by moving some letters around. But it's a big change. And change is a scary thing for many of us. Even if you like change, even if you're somebody who lives a dynamic life, you want things to change, you want things to change in the way you want them to change, with you in control of the change, to the degree that you wish for things to change. One of the biggest changes that a person can go through is motherhood. Motherhood is a massive change for a woman, right? Emotionally, spiritually, you're now connected with this person that's outside of your body who once uh, had their mailing address was inside your body. And, and if your children are doing well, typically you're doing well. If your children are not doing well, things are not going well. And that's a major change. Not to mention the physical changes that a woman's body goes through in the midst of pregnancy and labor. There are scars. There are markings. There's evidence, physical evidence, that a woman gave birth. Beyond, obviously, the child that exists now. And your body never goes back, often to the way that it was. Change is a major event. It's a scary thing. No matter how small, no matter how big, change is intimidating. So what I want us to do today, as we look at Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17, that classic Mother's Day passage on old and new wineskins. It was a joke. I want us to talk about spiritually how we can pursue change and thrive in the midst of change. I'm not going to talk about other components of change. I'm only going to talk about how you can follow Jesus in the midst of change, how you can go from here to there with your spiritual life, not just intact, but thriving. We're really going to revolve around three ideas, what to ask, what to allow, and then what to adopt. What to ask, what to allow, and what to adopt. First, let's ask the right questions. The right questions. Verse 14 of chapter 9. Then the disciples of John, that's John the Baptist, came to him, that's Jesus, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? John's disciples want to know why Jesus' disciples do things differently than they do them. John said that Jesus was the Messiah. He's the one that's supposed to take religious fervor up a notch. It's supposed to go from 10 to 11 with Jesus in charge. He's the guy. But it doesn't seem that way. Why are they asking this? Why are they looking and saying, your disciples seem to be slackers? What's going on? If you look at the context around this passage, first, Jesus' teaching on fasting is private. When you fast, don't be like the religious leaders and tell everybody about it. Make a big deal out of it. Keep it private. So even if the disciples are fasting, John's disciples wouldn't know about it. On top of that, the previous passage, Jesus is having a meal with Matthew the tax collector and his friends. Matthew, the writer of the gospel that we're reading, before he became a best-selling author, was a tax collector. And he's a sinner according to the religious establishment. So not only is Jesus not taking religious devotion up a notch, it seems like he's actually going the other direction. You're the Messiah. What is going on here? And these disciples, John's disciples, essentially make two mistakes. 
with this question. The first is they ask why. Why? Why is not a good question. It's not a good question. Why do you do it this way, but we do it this way? Why do they have it easier than we do? We do this all the time. Why, God, do I have to go through this change? Why, God, does this change have to be so extreme? Why is the timing of this change so bad? Why, why, why? And why is not a helpful question? And ironically, I will tell you why it's not a helpful question. It's because you're not likely to get an answer from God in a timely manner that's going to help you with the change. Say that again. You're likely not to get an answer from God that's going to help you with the change. Now, in hindsight, you may be able to identify why God has done what he's done in your life. But look at Job. Job loses everything. And as far as we know, Job never finds out that he was the subject of a, of a cosmic sort of, of, of discussion between God and Satan. He never finds that out. When God answers him, God says, you don't know what you're talking about. And you know what Job's response is? I'm summarizing like four chapters here. Job's response is, you're right, I don't, I'll shut up now. End of the book of Job. You don't have to read it. Nailed it. So what do you ask? Is it wrong to ask questions of God? Hear me on this. Absolutely not. It is just fine to ask questions of God. But let me give you a better question than why. How? How? Look at Mary. Can we go ahead and agree that Mary is the greatest mother of all time? She raised the Lord, okay? That is a major feather in the cap. I don't care how challenging your children were or are, she raised the Messiah, okay? Mary is approached by an angel who tells her, you are going to become pregnant. And Mary says, what? How is this to be because I'm still a virgin? She doesn't say why. Why are you choosing me, God? I'm not good enough for this. Why I was going to have the perfect little house with Joseph with 3.5 children and on and on. No. She says the question of faith. How? Lord Jesus, I'm on board. I guess not Jesus at that point, but spirit, I'm on board. How are you going to pull this off? How are we going to make this happen? What role do you have for me? You see, how is a question of faith. It's a question of, I'm on board. Let me know what details I need to know so that I can make it happen. Why is a question that's stuck in a previous life. Why is a question of stagnation. Why can sometimes border on faithlessness if you're not careful. The next problem that they have is one of comparison. They look at Jesus' disciples, they look at themselves, they look at the Pharisees, and they say, why are we different? Comparison is a difficult thing to avoid. We almost can't help comparing ourselves to other people. It's especially difficult. We either look at somebody else and think they're where we want to be or praise God, we're not where they're at. Or we look at our own lives and we look at some imaginary version of ourself that we've put in the future. And we've said, I'm gonna be like this person in five years or 10 years. And when our story doesn't line up with the pacing that we have for ourselves, we get discouraged, we get frustrated, we get angry at God. And we start asking why. You see, comparison is this vehicle often through which we install and uninstall the idols that rule our lives. Because we look at what other people have or the mystery future version of myself and I compare myself and I say, what do I need to do? What do I need to have in order to get to that point? And we start to worship that thing because because Jesus stops being our North Star, the one by which we decide whether our life is successful or not. 
Mother's Day is an especially difficult time for comparison. If you're a mother, you look around, or you're a grandmother, you look around and you think to yourself, why can't my kids be like so-and-so's kids? If you've ever been to dinner with another couple and your kids have misbehaved but their kids haven't, that is the dessert that you get to enjoy on the way home. Why are my kids not better behaved? While the dessert the other family gets to enjoy is, wow, those kids, those are the pastor's kids, and they were really all over the place. <laughs> my kids are great, and I love them. Comparison, when you're a mom, it's big, right? Why are my kids not as successful? Why are my kids not as smart? Why are my kids not as happy? Why are my kids not married? Why do my kids not have grandkids? And then, if you're one of the women that's longing for those spots, right? Longing to have children of your own. Why do we not have children? What's wrong with me? Why do other people have children? I would be a better mother than that person. Why do they have children and I do not? Mother's Day is rife with comparison. And it's dangerous. It's born out of grief, I understand it, but it's dangerous. So what do you do? Comparison is essentially a narrative question. Why is my story not like I thought it should be or like the people over there? Why, why is it not like that? And so what you have to do is you have to embrace instead the story that God has for you. What is Christ's plan for my life? What does he want from me? What narrative is being told in my life? Now that's difficult because sometimes we wind up in a movie that we don't want to be in. Sometimes we wind up in a story that we're like, this is not what I thought it would be. So what do you do? Talk to somebody this week about lament and how lament is not something we do well because we're so busy. And he suggested this, one, when you're lamenting, you write down everything you feel. I'm angry at God for this. I'm frustrated that I don't have that. I'm sad that this isn't going the way that it should. And you write it out. Look at the psalmists. The psalmists are very vocal about their frustrations. But at some point, you make a turn from what you feel to what you believe. Yes, I want children, but I believe that God has the best for me. Yes, I want my kids to do this, but I believe that God has the best for them. Yes, I want my body after giving birth to go back to what it looked like before, but I believe that God uses anything and everything, and he can still use me. At some point, and the exercise here is to move you from judging your life based on what you feel, which emotions are not bad, feelings are not bad, but moving your life more in line with what you believe than what you feel. Now, we mentioned earlier, God, why is the time of this change happening? Sometimes we're on board with a change, but we don't like the timing of it. So let's talk about timing and how we need to allow for God's timing. Look at verse 15. Verse 15, and Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus is making a comparison between two social events that we still participate in today, weddings and funerals. Jesus is saying that during a wedding, when the bride and the groom are there, you don't fast, you feast, you enjoy, you celebrate. To fast is strange in that situation. Ever been stuck at a table with a guest who's like, oh, I'm not eating anything today. That's awkward at a wedding. Move food around on your plate, at least. Make the other guests feel comfortable. Jesus is saying, I'm the bridegroom, and as long as I'm here, there will be no fasting. But then he says something else. He says, soon the bridegroom, I, Jesus, will be taken away, and then they will fast. You see, what Jesus is talking about here is a different reason to fast. John's disciples are talking about fasting out of religious devotion. 
Jesus is talking about fasting out of grief. You can't eat because you're grieving. Jesus is doing something different here. You see, what Jesus is saying is, John's disciples are struggling with the change that's taking place now. They're not ready for the new covenant. They're not ready for this change. And Jesus is saying, the time for your struggle with this change is happening now. My disciples are gonna struggle with this change later when I die. If you look around at your life and you wanna know why you're going through a season of change, maybe it's a season of suffering or struggle. Can I tell you something? It will happen to everyone. All of us will struggle. All of us will suffer. If you are going through that now, then it is just your time. And then later on, it will be mine. And then later on, it will be someone else's. Because that's how it works. That's what it's like living in a fallen world. Ecclesiastes 3, every season, there's a time, there's a purpose under heaven. All of us will go through suffering. And this is what's so difficult about change. It's the timing. It seems to come at the worst possible time. And we're trying to keep up with Jesus in the midst of it. We're trying to walk with him, trying to stride with him. Have you ever been on a walk with a small child? It's less of a walk and more of an experience because the child will run ahead, they'll fall behind, then they get tired and you kind of have to like coax them. And then eventually you just drag them places. And you know everyone in the neighborhood is looking at you like you're a like child kidnapper or something. You're like, don't judge me, it, they're mine. Jesus is incredibly difficult to keep pace with. And it's not his fault because he's the grown up here. We wanna run ahead to what God has for us next. And then we find a season we like and we fall behind. And then eventually Jesus just comes to us and says, you can't stay here anymore. Let's go. And we feel dragged into a new season of change, often kicking and screaming. Keeping pace with Jesus is difficult. Walking with the Lord is hard. And you know why I think this is especially hard for us? And I'm talking to the people who are Park City's Baptist Church people, okay? You live in the neighborhood, you maybe live over in Lake Highlands, you live in North Dallas, you're an American, I'm talking to you. Here's why it's hard. Because we have forgotten how to follow. Because most of us are leaders, we're entrepreneurs, we're CEOs, we're partners in our firm, or we are being groomed to become that. And so we are taught to take initiative, to seize the initiative, or, and this was true in my own family, if you were a stay-at-home parent or stay-at-home person, that person typically is the pace setter for the family. We're gonna do this. Mom, mom is usually the way it was. It was my mom growing up, it's my wife now, maybe I'm the problem. But we're gonna do this, then we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and everybody's really happy. When you are in such a rhythm of being the one that takes initiative and sets the agenda, when it comes to the Lord, you're not quite accustomed to taking a step back and saying, okay, Jesus, it's all yours. You're not trained. So how do you do that? You have to learn the art, master the art of biblical waiting. And this is three components. I'm going to do them quickly, okay? One, it's prayer. Prayer is not sitting on your hands and doing nothing. It is a very active component. When you go to make your list of things I feel and things I believe, we feel that prayer is sitting around wasting time. Don't pretend like you don't feel that. Sometimes I do too. But I believe that it makes a difference. I believe that it matters. I believe that it's the most important thing that I can do in the middle of waiting. The second thing is that when you are going through a season of change, typically we know what's coming. And so we can begin to prepare. One of the things you should do to prepare for a season of change is to start living as the Christ follower that's already in that season. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're looking at a promotion at work and you think to yourself, what is a godly manager going to do in that position? Again, I'm not talking about anything else, just a godly manager. That godly manager is not going to use their employees 
and not know anything about them. They're going to love them. They're going to get to know them. They're going to care for their kids. They're going to acknowledge their birthdays, their anniversaries, their holidays. They're going to be involved in their lives outside of even work. Even if it's just a text being like, hey, hope you're having a great weekend. Make sure to get some rest this weekend. You're going to shepherd the people who work for you. Now you might say, well, Travis, I don't have that title yet. Don't wait for the title. Do it now. Get ready for that change now. Live now the way you think somebody would live in the situation you're approaching. That's how you wait biblically. And then lastly, you need to be in a community. You need to be involved in a group, a connect group, We just watched the Joderies talk about the group that meets in their house. If you don't have one, start one. There's connect groups here that meet on Sunday mornings. You cannot live your life soloing Christianity. It just won't work. It is a team sport and you are not Roger Federer. Team sport is Christianity. Lastly, when it comes to change, eventually we just have to adopt what God gives for us. So let's talk about how to adopt what God gives us. Verse 16, no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst, the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins, And so both are preserved. Jesus tells two mini parables here to talk about the kingdom of God. The first one makes sense to us. Clothing. If you have a pre-shrunk piece of clothing and you put an unshrunk patch on it, when you wash it, the patch will shrink and it'll tear the clothing. If you don't understand how that works, talk to the person who does laundry in your home. They will explain it to you. The other one we don't quite understand because we're Baptists and we don't really understand wine. (laughs) But wine is really just grape juice that has fermented. I know, my mind was blown too when I read the commentary. (laughs) It is fermented. So what happens is they would take old, uh, they would take wine or grape juice, they would pour it into a wine skin. Now, if it was an older wineskin, it would not be pliable. It wouldn't be flexible. But new wineskins were. They had some give to them. And so as the fermenting process took place, pressure would build. And if you didn't have any give, the old wineskin would explode. It would would bust, right? The new wineskins had more give in them. And Jesus is talking about a new covenant, a new agreement with God and his people. And what he's saying is, if you try to fit the new thing that God is doing in the world, the new covenant, Jesus crucified, buried, resurrected, if you try to fit that into the old covenant way of doing things, with the temple, with sacrifices, with uh, ritual laws, with all that stuff, with the strict religious observances, it's going to break this. It's going to ruin it. Jesus says we need to have new methods, new modes of doing things, new ways of doing things, new methods. So Jesus institutes worshiping in spirit and in truth, the Lord's Supper, baptism. And this new covenant absolutely busts the seams of Judaism. Because initially Christianity starts as a subset of Judaism. And in about 30 or 40 years, It's its own thing. You see, John's disciples don't see this. They don't see the big picture, but it's critical that they do, and here's why. Because if they don't, they will be left behind. Look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees used to be the good guys. They used to be the good guys. In the intertestamental period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, a group of people realized that the reason why God sent them into exile was because they had lost their devotion to him. 
And so the Pharisees came along and said, hey, to make sure we're not going to break God's laws, let's make a series of laws around it. So if you break one of those, it's okay. We're not going to offend God. And that's why they have all these rules. Well, then over 400 years, they get it in their head that their rules are just as important as God's rules. And they don't change. They become the bad guys. And look what John's disciples are doing. Look who they're allying themselves with. They're saying, we're like the Pharisees. That's the same group of people that their own founder, John the Baptist, called a brood of vipers. Because the new covenant is moving forward. The kingdom is advancing. And John's disciples are very much in danger of being left behind in the midst of it. Neither one of these groups is still around here today. What happens when God brings change into your life? If you try to hold on to the old ways of doing things, but still try to follow Jesus, you know what it's going to do? It's going to rip you apart. It's going to bust you. Because Jesus gives us new wine. Those groups are not around anymore. They didn't even make it out of the first century. The Pharisees fell apart after the destruction of the temple, and we don't know what happened to John's disciples. Odds are, they either went back to Judaism, some of them, or some of them folded in with the church. If we try to keep doing things the same way that we've always done them, either as a body of believers or as an individual, whenever God does something new, it'll blow us up. We're going to burst. So I'm going to talk to two different groups of people just for a moment. I'm going to talk to those of you watching online, and I first want to talk to those of them in the room. But it's about the same idea. We have gone through a major season of change. COVID changed the game in the church world. And to be honest with you, many of us don't know exactly how much it has changed. We're still trying to figure that out. But it has changed things. And I'm going to be honest, there's some things that aren't going to go back to the old way of doing things. Those days are gone. And in church history books moving forward, they will mark like 2020 is the year when all this changed. There's a whole group of people outside these walls. Are we going to hold on to our old wineskins and not be willing to reach them? Because that's not the history of this church. This church wanted to start a contemporary service, a move, by the way, that would rip most churches apart. But you know what this church did? Made new wineskins, built a new wineskin, and we called it the Great Hall. And we allowed that to take shape. Will we continue to make new wineskins for the new thing that God wants to do? Or are we going to calcify and be cemented in the ways that we've always done things? I hope not. Now, I'm not sitting here, I'm not doing this thing that I think pastors sometimes get accused of doing, where we're like getting you ready for a change that's going to happen six months from now, but I'm like priming the pump. (laughs) My mind is completely blank in that regard. I don't know if that's comforting or alarming. (laughs) But I'll tell you this, although I have nothing specific in mind, change is coming. Prepare yourself. For those of you online. Praise God for online worship, right? Like how many of us during COVID, we had an opportunity to be together, to worship together, virtually, praise God. And I'm thankful for it. It gives us an opportunity to check out the church. If you're new, you wanna see what it's like in this room, you don't even have to come on campus. You can see what it's like. Praise God for that. As an introvert, I love that idea. Or if you're on vacation, you can still connect with your church. Or if you're sick, you don't have to miss communion. You can be around other believers. It's a good tool. It should not be your only engagement with the church. If your only engagement is watching online, that is not the intention and purpose of it. And I know this because the Son of God put on flesh and dwelt amongst men. God did not virtually engage with his people. He did it in person. I encourage you to do the same. Follow in the footsteps of your Lord and come to church physically. Is there anything special about a building? No. Is there something special about being with other believers? Yes. Make that move. And maybe that's a change that God's doing in your life. And the reason why change is difficult for us as believers, and I'll close with this, is because Jesus 
held up the night before he was crucified. He held up a cup with wine in it and he said, this is the new covenant which is made in my blood. And every time you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. We took the Lord's Supper last week. Jesus wants to take his blood and pour it into every part of your life. And like, a, like wine that's in old wineskins, it's going to bust some areas of your life. It's going to remake new areas of your life. Sometimes Jesus takes the old wineskins and his blood transforms them into new wineskins. Because Jesus can do that. For some of you in here, the biggest change that needs to happen today, or for you watching online, is that you need to come to know Christ for the first time. You need to let him break the old wineskins of sin and addiction or whatever it is, and let his lifeblood pour into you and become the person that he's always wanted you to be by giving your life to him, by trusting in his death, his burial, and resurrection. For those of us who have been Christians for a long time, guess what? I've been a Christian since I was seven. I piled up the old wineskins. I got certain ways of doing things. And when Jesus does something new in our lives, we need to be ready for him to transform them or break them. Is there an area of your life that needs transformation or breaking? That's called sanctification. And that's the Lord working in your life. And sometimes it hurts. Are you ready for change? Ask the right questions. Ask God, God, how are you going to change me this year? How are you going to change me this week? Allow for God's timing. Be patient with him. Or some of us need to hustle up. We're behind. And then we need to adopt the change that God gives us. Because his blood flowed for you and for me. Let it flow into every area of your life, breaking some old ways of doing things and at the same time creating new ones. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the new life that you offer to us by giving us a new life, new creation. We are new wineskins, Lord. I pray that you would give our church new ways of doing things, creativity, brilliance, while still holding on to the great old things that are here. The old wineskins weren't thrown out. They were used for other things. Lord, let us be wise in what we do with our methods. Bless each mother and woman in this room. May this day not be a day that is bittersweet. May it just be sweet. Because our Lord is sweet. And you care for us as a mother hen. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.